Hi, I'm Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, providing tips on language learning, culture, and human development. And I don't know if you are a teacher, if you've ever experienced in your own class times where a classroom lesson fails miserably. It goes like down like a well, just things just don't turn out the way that you want. And such a lesson leaves students confused and scratching their head and also leaving you feeling, well, emotionally drained and empty. And that said, I think such a disappointing lesson could actually turn out to be an unexpected gift leading to greater renewal, innovation, and growth. And in today's broadcast, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share some 10 tips or ideas on why classroom lessons sometimes fail, at least temporarily, and how we can turn those failures into greater successes. And that is the focus of today. Well, as I was preparing for the broadcast today, I was trying to think of all of those possible situations where we all encounter, you know, boredom, student and teacher boredom, a confusing lesson, failed technology, uh, uncooperative students and uninvited guests like your supervisor drops in and you weren't expecting it. And as I was thinking about today's broadcast, I was thinking about all the possible names I could give this particular broadcast, like one lesson down and 45 lessons to go. I don't know if I can continue teaching or ways that lessons flop and how we can recover or surviving a crash and burn lesson or when a lesson goes wrong and how to recover. Or one of my favorites is starting your new job in carpet sales after your teaching job just doesn't work out. Well, as I was looking at all these, I think I started to reflect on my own teaching of recent, even recently when a classroom lesson I was teaching just didn't seem to go well. And so I came up with a lesson, the topic for today of how to turn a failed lesson into success. And one of the things that I would encourage you throughout the broadcast is to share whether you're a student watching the broadcast and, you know, a lesson in your class didn't go very well, or as a teacher, some of the reasons why you think class uh, lessons fail and how to recover. One of the things I want to keep in mind is this, is sometimes a classroom failure actually could be a gift that can lead to greater growth and innovation. And one of the things that certainly I want to focus on is these ideas today. To begin with, I'd like to share with you a quote. This is from Dave uh, Burg Burgess, who is the author of the book, Teach Like a Pirate. And uh, he indicated this, safe lessons are a, rep uh, a re recipe for mediocrity. You never know where those edges are until you fall off them. In other words, we often, as a teacher, play it safe. Stay within the comfortable boundaries that we know without getting out to the edges of our abilities to see where those lessons go. He also shared the idea, if you haven't failed in the classroom lately, you aren't pushing the envelope far enough. And the idea, here's an idiomatic expression of, pushing the envelope of approaching the limits of what is possible. So the idea is, if you haven't failed, there could be a, a, a number of different reasons, of course, lack of preparation, but sometimes maybe we're not pushing the boundaries of what is possible. And that's what I'd like to explore today. And I'd like to, as we talk today, I'd like to share some general ideas related to this on how we can find greater success in our classrooms. And I think that is the focus. Uh, to do so, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just introduce you a little bit to, about myself, my own teaching experiences. Uh, currently, I live in the United States. I live in Utah. And Utah is the second driest state in the United States. And I work at the University of Utah right now. I work at the English Language Institute at the University of Utah, and I live in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is the capital of the state, uh, is a beautiful state, and the city of Salt Lake is surrounded 
by mountains, which I really enjoy. I enjoy hiking and running. And one of the nice features about Utah, it is a wonderful place of scenic beauty from high mountain ranges and forests to extreme desert. And uh, certainly it is a place that I enjoy living and enjoy teaching. But in the program where I teach, it's a, a program of eight different levels. It's an intensive language program specifically designed for students wanting to matriculate into university programs. And we have students from around the world, from, from you know Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, from Europe. And all of these students want to have a wonderful experience in their learning. But one of the things that I found even in my own teaching is sometimes problems come up in my lessons. And I would be interested in hearing for you some of those problems that also will come up with you in your own lessons. And so today what I'd like to do with your help, I'd like to share 10 issues and solutions that can impact the efficacy, you could say, of our lessons, the successes of our lessons. And what I'd like to do is invite you, both students and teachers, to share your ideas on the factors that lead to really successful lessons. So I'm going to give 10 of these. I would encourage you throughout the broadcast today to share your experiences related to these points. Again, the reason why I do these live broadcasts is so that you, the listener, can be come a part of the conversation, which I think is really important for you to uh, be a part of. So let's go ahead. Uh, number one, not fully assessing students' learning styles and study habits. I think there are many teachers that perhaps right at the beginning of their course, maybe give students a diagnostic test to check their abilities in the language. But the other things I think teachers should be thinking about is issues related to what kind of students are they? Like, what are their learning styles? Uh, what are their study habits? And uh, Or in addition, what concerns or fears do these students have in learning English? And in my case, specifically from students from around the world in the same classroom. So I would be interested for you, how do you approach this? How do you find out and determine the students' abilities and successes and skills? And one of the resources I use comes from a website called educationpartner.org. And the nice thing about this particular website, it allows students, I'm going to show the link here as well, and the link is on in the show notes on Facebook, so I've already posted that is this allows teachers or students individually to actually take different assessments. Number one, what is your learning style? You know, visual, auditory, tactile learner. Also, what kind of student are you? What are your study habits? And this type of tool I found that has been very useful because it allows me right from the beginning, rather than imposing upon the class of my students what I think or the ideal learning styles, they can actually do this online assessment and you can actually print it out and download it and minister with your students so that you can find out right from the beginning what are their, you know, what are their learning needs, their preferences and their concerns. I think what we do without doing that, without assessing students, not only linguistic skills, but their emotional needs, their learning styles, and crafting our lessons based on that, I think that's really important to, to start out with. And perhaps what I can do is I can uh, give me an example. Uh, oh, uh, Layla says, we should always do a diagnostic at the beginning of the year. Absolutely. Thank you, Layla. And I think that diagnostic, at least for me, in the beginning, I always did a language diagnostic but then I started to doing a learning styles diagnostic, as I just showed you there. And I showed the link also, which is right here. Again, this is one example. Uh, perhaps I can share why this is so important. Recently, uh, generally, I'm going to mention this a little bit later in the broadcast, uh, that I wanted to find out how students were feeling about the cl their classroom experience with me. 
And then I began to realize that some of the students, although I feel that working in part with partners, working in groups is so vital, there are some students that told me in a private survey that I administered, you know what, Randall, I really don't like working in groups. It's my next step to find out why. Is there anything that I can do to make that more comfortable? And so I was starting to identify that, yes, while I feel group work and pair work are so important, there are students in the classroom that really prefer, in some cases, to work individually on certain type of tasks. So I think it's really incumbent upon us to be really aware of these particular needs, not only doing a linguistic diagnostic, and thank you, Layla, for mentioning that, but also trying to assess what some of their other needs are in the classroom. So feel free to share what are you doing uh, to actually assess your students' learning styles and habits in the classroom. I would be interested in bringing that into the conversation, just like Layla shared with us. Uh, the next point I want to share with you is often selecting content beyond the linguistic, cultural, emotional, and emotional reach of our learners. Now, I think that the first idea of selecting content outside of the linguistic reach of students is something that I think we've often discussed either in groups, uh, with other teachers, and that's one of the things that I want to share and I add to the conversation right now is that sometimes all of the points that I'm sharing with you today, really, you can greatly benefit by having an online di uh, an ongoing dialogue with other teachers with whom you're working or like today. I think that's really key. So first of all, what I want to talk about is what do I mean by selecting content within the linguistic, cultural, and emotional reach of students? First of all, let me talk about the easy one, which is dealing with linguistic reach of students. And uh, it, to do so, often there are teachers that as they're thinking about materials, they're thinking about using materials from other sources like YouTube or other streaming platforms. And this, perhaps I could add this to the conversation right now, is that you as a teacher, how do you go about selecting materials? Do you adapt materials that you find? Do you adopt materials that you're finding? Or do you create your own? For those teachers that are actually using YouTube or other streaming platforms, one of the challenges that often teachers do, I've done this as well, is that you select, let's say, a YouTube video online, and then you play it to your students, and then you realize after playing it for the 52nd time that it's just way beyond the linguistic reach. The speed is just going so quickly. And many times that over the years, YouTube has made some adjustments. There is actually a feature within YouTube videos where it has adjustable speed control. But in order to bring those within the linguistic reach of students, one of the features that I use, and this is for desktop uh, computers uh, using the Chrome browser, is I use a feature that is called the Video Speed Controller for Chrome. In other words, it is a feature that you can download and add to the Chrome browser on your desktop computer. And I'm showing you an example right here from my website. I have a section, a new section on idioms, and I have my own YouTube videos embedded into the language activity. But if you, you can kind of faintly see it in the video, and I have it a little bit larger, is that what the speed controller can do it actually can address just the speed in short increments, in smaller increments. Currently with YouTube, you can adjust it by 5% increments, like you can play it at 95% speed or 90% speed. But with this speed controller for Chrome, it allows you to adjust the speed at 93% or 88% to slow down the audio so that it gets within the linguistic reach of your students. One of the exciting features, I think, of this particular uh, uh, extension is that it works on all kinds of videos. For example, Netflix. Have you ever wanted to maybe show a piece of, of movie, either for yourself or encouraging your students? You can use the same Chrome extension, and it'll appear, it'll open up in, 
in Netflix and you can adjust the speed control. Now, Netflix and YouTube, as I mentioned, have their own variable speed control. But with this Chrome browser extension, you can adjust it in smaller increments to make it a wonderful uh, feature for your language learning. Uh, again, we have some other people joining from the broadcast. Uh, welcome from Tunisia and from Costa Rica. And as I mentioned earlier, feel free to let us know what you're doing in your classrooms to enhance language learning. The first thing that I just mentioned is talking about uh, selecting content beyond the linguistic reach. So when I'm using this point number two, sometimes when we do that, classroom lessons kind of in a way, fail. Uh, we have to rethink what we're doing. And we realize that students become discouraged because the content is just too hard. What I want to do now is I want to share, what do I mean by cultural and emotional reach? One of the things that I've done over time is in addition to a diagnostic, a language diagnostic, I've also asked students some of the topics, this is right at the beginning of the class, some of the topics that they would feel comfortable in discussing in the class. Some issues that maybe involve world issues, that involve mental health, that involve perhaps uh, substance abuse. And one of the topics that I've spoken on, at least on my broadcast, is about suicide awareness and prevention. Our son died by suicide 10 years ago. And there can be cases in which a discussion dealing with some sensitive topics like cyberbullying and so forth could be a part of the classroom. But I tried to avoid imposing what I think would be useful in the classroom by getting input from students about the things that they would find useful as well. So as I'm sharing those ideas, uh, again, we want to do some type of assessment as well. Uh, Mesa says, uh, in my class today, I use one of your audios in two task listening and reading skill. I asked my students about the theme and the central idea after listening. And I also use questions to teach making inferences of uh, making inferences. And it was really beneficial. And thank you, Mesa, for bringing that up, because in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the types of questions that we can ask. And I think that's a really big key to what we're doing in the classroom. Uh, thank you, Mesa from the United Arab Emirates. Sonia says, I adapt material to the level of students and their listen linguistic reach. Thank you very much, Sonia. I think that's a really important uh, point there. And the idea of adjusting it not only to the linguistic reach, but the cultural reach. I have students from again, from Saudi Arabia, from around the world. And I have to be really careful as I'm introducing content that it meets those particular needs for students. Uh, another, Hon Thang says, I'm interested in learning lessons from Randall's website. I like the new section on idioms. It's interesting to learn and remember and use the idioms through sample sentences, conversation questions, speaking questions. Thank you for sharing that. And that is very much connected to what I'm saying is whether you're a learner or a, a, a teacher, adjusting the level, I think is important. So again, selecting content within the linguistic reach. Thank you for sharing and continue conversation. Uh, the other idea is using content or activities that don't engage the learner. One of the things I have to ask is really what activities will activate the learner's domain of interests and skills? I have always felt, well, let's play games. Let's do activities. Let's do dialogue. Let's do group activities. But as I just mentioned at the beginning, the first real key to make sure that your classes and the lessons will thrive, not just that you won't just survive, but thrive is being is doing some type of assessment. And this is, again, doing some type of needs assessment and interest. So at the beginning of each session of my program, I give a students a list of five questions that is kind of an inventory about them, their concerns about the class, their interests, and this is shared with the rest of the class. So the rest of the class understands as well the interest of other students. So as I think about using activities, I think that sometimes games can be very useful 
However, I have some students that, Randall, this, this class is not about games, even though my games, and I call them language activities, are very short. They have different learning styles that they would they feel they would benefit in a different type of activity. So balancing that out rather than imposing what I feel would be the most successful type of activity, I try to do that assessment to find out what students really need. Some students love games and others do not. Um, let's see, whatever. Again, we're... Uh, looking at some other comments that are coming in, uh, Layla mentions teachers should help their students to enhance their self-confidence. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the keys, that self-confidence actually tied to selecting material that's within the linguistic range of the students. Thank you, Layla, for sharing that. And if you have any particular uh, idea, please share that as well. I think Layla was talking about totally agreeing with some of the ideas Thank you. Um, also, Sonia says, very good point. Content uh, shouldn't be offensive so students feel at ease, especially if they're from different cultural backgrounds. And Sonia, thank you for uh, bringing that comment up because that is so important. Again, I have students, as a, right in one of my classes right now, I have students from Mongolia, I have students from Japan, I have students from South America, from Saudi Arabia. And you might think that a particular topic is appropriate to students, and then you realize it might not be. So again, for me, doing some type of interest um, survey at the beginning of the class, things that students would be open to discussing and those that they wouldn't, I think is a really key point. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, the next point I want to share with you is, oh, and this is kind of going back to what I was just talking about. Give students a voice on what and how they want to learn. In other words, is that allowing them to be a part of the selection process is important. Now, I realize, and I would be interested for those teachers out there that are watching, are you able to select your own materials or are the books that you have to use dictated by your school or by a local or national government? Please share how those selection of materials take place because then we have to think of ways of how to integrate uh, our lessons and our ideas uh, and kind of weave those into our lessons as well. Uh, the next idea is, is what I want to share is number four, is using activities whose content and instructions are clear. Now, this might sound really simple, but often it is not. It's kind of like, for example, if I'm using a textbook and they have some activities that say, select the most appropriate response for each item. And your students are at a very low level. They're not sure what the word select, appropriate response, item. So why don't we just instead just say, choose the best answer. So the ideas of making sure even in the instructions, I mean, you don't want, the, the instructions should not be more difficult than the activity that you're trying to do. And sometimes that ha, ha, uh, tends to be the case. Um, some other ideas that come coming in is, uh, oh, here's an idea from Jorge uh, from Bolivia. He says, uh, hello, nice to see you again from Bolivia. Well, in my opinion, it's good for me to do both things at the same time. You can focus on your central idea. They give you good results. What is your opinion, dear teacher? So asking students questions, getting them to ask questions, I think is really important as well. And uh, also reading and listening uh, to the student, to the teacher, I think are really important skills. So again, doing a variety of things at the same time, making sure that our instructions are clear. And feel free uh, during the broadcast right now, if you've had an experience where you've given a lesson and that lesson failed miserably, how did you grow and learn from that? Feel free to share. All right, so that was number four. Again, talking about uh, making sure our activities, the instructions are very clear and so forth. The next uh, point I want to share with you is not preparing for unexpected interruptions or a multiplicity of learning scenarios. 
I would be interested, those that are watching right now is, what are some of the things that have come up unexpectedly in your classroom, whether it be with technology, whether it would be with uh, you know the power going out or whatever, that you were just not in expecting and how that affected your lesson? Perhaps as you're thinking of those ideas, let me share a couple of examples. Uh, over the last year, I've interviewed teachers from around the world, and a common theme or common comment has been that many teachers have said, you know what, Randall, you know, in my classrooms and not only in my classrooms, but with my students, sometimes the internet service and connections are just really spotty. Uh, you know, I, I might tell students to do a particular activity and then in their area, in the jungle, the internet connection is really not very good. Uh, the switch to remote learning, I think, has been really challenging and painful for many people. Or just the idea of, you know, your administrator just drops in unexpectedly. You weren't expecting that at all. That creates a little bit of tension and nervousness. And your students are not expecting that. And the administrator is just saying, I'm just watching in the background. That certainly can be really challenging. So feel free to share what are some of those things that have come up unexpectedly in your classroom that you weren't just uh, being uh, expecting? Uh, going back, Virginia says that is true. And going back to the point about instructions, you should be simple and clear with the instructions. Uh, Virginia, please tell us where you are from so we can kind of understand that s situation, perhaps where you are. Uh, again, Elef is from Tunisia. Welcome. So, uh, that is, I think, not preparing for unexpected interruptions, I think is so critical. And, and again, feel free to share some of those situations that you had yourself. Uh, the next idea is claiming more knowledge than we have. And I think number six and number seven are very similar, is dismissing valid questions because you don't know the answer. Now, Randall, what do you mean by that? And again, feel free to share any comments you have about any of the ideas I've shared so far. But I remember many years ago as a new teacher, students asking me questions that I really had no idea about. For example, uh, teacher, I have a question right here. Which one do I use in this case? I'm tired. I want to lie down or I want to lay down. And I remember being asked that years and years ago as a new teacher, and I started to think about that. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, that's something we do in level 26 grammar. You don't have to worry about it right now. Or, oh, there's no more time. I guess we'll have to wait till tomorrow. So one of the things what I'm trying to indicate is that sometimes when students ask really good questions, do we dismiss their valid questions? Do we, if we realize, oh no, my explanation is really going south. In other words, it's failing miserably and I don't know how to rescue my lesson. Could we, just like it happened this past week, I, was ha I had a lesson and I realized, oh, you know, my explanation and the materials that I'm using right now are not really clear. And I had to, at, as I was going through it, I had to pause I have to acknowledge, you know what, these instructions and this example are not really clear. And then I followed up by saying, let me get back with you on this. I think it's really important. And then I sent them an email with some new instructions, a new example that showed them that, number one, I acknowledged I was authentic in the idea that the way I was presenting it wasn't the clearest. And I showed them that their questions were very important. So I think I think we have to be really ready and open not to dismiss questions that are very valid. Uh, oh, uh, Virginia, thank you for letting us know from Costa Rica. Welcome. Uh, Jorge from Bolivia says, yes, lay and lie are confusing ideas. Oh, there's so many of those, you know, farther and further, and we could go down the list. So sometimes we as teachers can't anticipate exactly what's going to come up but if we, if students say, you know, what is lay and lie and, and you're not sure about transitive and intransitive verbs, it might be something where you are vulnerable to say, this is a really good question. I'm going to find out the answer. And you give them the answer. You start out the next lesson 
with the answer to the question that they had. And you don't just hope that they forgot about the question completely. Uh, another, uh, uh, Layla is saying here, he said, I prepare a lesson with animated pictures and color messages. I did, I, I did a big effort, but when I did the assessment, I discovered that the content was very hard. They couldn't follow. I felt disappointed. Thank you, Layla, for sharing that and being vulnerable to acknowledge that. And as I mentioned before, at least for me, I've been thinking three or four days now about all oh, that lesson that really went, you know, didn't really go well. What are my students going to think about me? Oh, how is this going to affect my assessment, my teacher evaluations? I know all of those are great stressors, but I find that when I've acknowledged just Layla, as you mentioned, this lesson didn't go well, but how can I turn that into success? Maybe I can just redo the lesson in a different way next time. Uh, Virginia says, it's okay not to know a topic that makes us human beings and gives them the idea that we can learn together. Thank you, Virginia from Costa Rica. And I think one of the comments that I've shared many times is true wisdom is knowing that we know nothing. And I think that sometimes we're so unaware of how unaware we are. And like Layla and Virginia mentioned and Jorge has mentioned as well, there are times when in the past, sometimes I didn't realize that a lesson was failing until later on when a student mentioned something and I realized, oh, that didn't go well at all. Now I find myself being mindful that I'm aware of a lesson not going well in the moment and trying to prepare. It's kind of mindfulness of being aware that something is not working out and trying to make adjustments in real time which can be really challenging to do. Um, uh, Virginia says, yes, I think maybe to the comment that we were talking. And uh, uh, Rosina, uh, Rosina, please let us know where you're from. We need to be honest and simply say, I don't know. I'll check. And one of the things I found, thanks Rosina for saying that, I think there were times in the past where I'd said, I don't know. I'll check. And then I never checked. Uh, so students, when you say I'm going to check, they're going to be waiting for that answer. And so what I usually do is at the beginning of the next lesson, if my previous lesson didn't go well, I come back and I check with them and I give a follow-up uh, you know, material and so forth to see if they really understand uh, now. So I think those are great ideas. All right. So that was number seven, don't dismiss valid questions. The next idea is number eight out of 10 I'm sharing today is assigning too little time to complete a task. I sometimes find that as my class is near, nearing the end and I realize, oh, wow, oh no, my class is ending. The students need a break. They need to go on to the next lesson. And then what I have a tendency to do, or at least in the past, I try to throw in, oh, we have two minutes now. And that, let me try to explain your homework. And there's just not enough time. And sometimes what I do is I rush through the explanation of what the students need to, need to do. And then they leave the classroom scratching their heads. One of the things that I found, and maybe some of you have found this useful, during the pandemic, I use an online platform associated with the university, very popular here in the United States. It's called Canvas, but I'm sure you use other means through email or WhatsApp or whatever you have, that anytime I'm running near the end of class, but I know that I can communicate with my students a longer explanation, I do it. Or I might create a video that I'm trying to go through a task I know that students are not going to be able to process the information and be prepared for the next class. I might create a short video that I share with them through Canvas, which is the system that we use. So again, whatever you're doing, whatever whether it's a learning task, going through exercise and so forth, I think you have to make sure that you have plenty of time to get them to process the information. Um, Oh, a couple of comments that are coming up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Virginia says, so as teachers, we have homework too. Absolutely. Uh, there are things that we can do. Uh, also that uh, Rosina says, beautiful Costa Rica. And yes, we need to follow up, up, up on those questions. 
Absolutely. I think sometimes when we have a question, students have a question, and this is, we need to follow up. And this is where relying on colleagues who might be able to support us, I don't think saying, I don't know, is a sign of weakness. It's a sign of true vulnerability and the, the willingness to grow. Again, we have some other people from Guatemala, uh, Guatemala joining. And uh, Layla from Tunisia says, I think sometimes we need to prepare more than one lesson for a lesson. Absolutely. If the lesson goes you know, faster than you planned, you have some other ideas that you have in your pocket ready to go. Uh, and Mona from Tunisia, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so, uh, so that's making sure that you assign enough time for a particular task. Uh, number nine out of 10 is not engaging all learners at their comfort levels. And this is one of the things I just mentioned a few minutes ago, linguistically, emotionally, culturally, intellectually. Uh, we have students, many students who are Muslim and at certain times of the year, uh, we have Ramadan that approaches and comes. And we want to make sure that our students who are observing Ramadan can do so in a very sensitive and a very meaningful way. So on those particular days during that month of Ramadan, we try to minimize distractions, uh, not bringing food into the classroom and things like that. We also have a prayer room for our students that where they can observe and, and spend uh, time to meditate and to think and to pray. And so when I'm talking about linguistically, emotionally, culturally, and intellectually, we want to make sure that we are engaging students in their comfort levels. And this goes back to the thing I mentioned at the beginning, doing some type of diagnostic. I know Layla mentioned that. Uh, and that diagnostic could include some of the other ideas about helping them and you assess their learning styles, their learning strategies. And I shared in the show notes, you'll find a link to one example, some online tools to be able to do that. Uh, the last idea I would like to share today is uh, also is about not using measures to check students' understanding and classroom experience. Now, one of the things that I still see teachers doing is asking this question. Any questions? Any questions? Do you understand? Now, imagine if you're in that particular class and you do not understand, do you think you're going to be able to raise your hand and acknowledge, you know what, teacher? I don't understand. I think a lot of students really feel uncomfortable about, you know, acknowledging that they don't understand, especially when you find that the people around you seem to be grasping it. They seem to want to go faster in the class and you feel alone. And so one of the things, rather than just saying, you know, do you understand so far? There are different ways of doing this. And this is one of the areas they're called uh, concept checking questions. You can find a lot of information online about these that rather than just saying, do you understand? Do you have any questions? Which most students will say, I have no questions. Uh, there are different ways of engaging learners in, in be better ways. For example, if I'm teaching just the simple, the future tense here with be going to, and you give a simple a, a sentence like, I'm going to see my friend tonight before eight o'clock. Instead of just simply saying to the students, uh, do you understand this? Are you okay with this sentence? Maybe you can ask questions like this. Is this situation past, present, or future? Kind of to a, do an initial assessment of whether students understand this point. Is this a plan, a promise, or a quick decision? Does it take place before or after 8 o'clock? Those type of questions, I think, really important to actually uh, assess meaning. Now, there are also, I don't know how many of you use Zoom or Microsoft Teams, but one of the things that I've done in my class is that you can set up small, quick assessment polls, checks, in the classroom that you can launch out to your students. Let's say they're on their portable device and it allows them to respond to a question like, uh, so how well do you understand this point? Now, if you ask that verbally, most people are gonna say, I understand it. But if there's a, one way of answering anonymously, 
then you're, there's a greater ability to assess meaning in those particular cases. Uh, a couple of ideas that are coming in. Virginia says, because of the pandemic, I now prepare short videos for my students so they have the chance to go back and review them. As a matter of fact, I keep making them after this pandemic. I think they're very useful. Absolutely, Virginia. And I think all of us uh, in my particular lessons, I again, I teach at the University of Utah, but I make uh, short little synopses, you could say, of the lessons, short little videos where students can go back and review them. And all of my uh, class lectures, not my lecture, my classes are all recorded. So I record all of my classes and students can watch those afterwards if they want. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Christine. Yeah, she uses those type of questions that I just mentioned before. Thank you, Christine, for mentioning it. I think those are really useful, those concept checking questions. I would encourage people to look online for more information regarding those. I think that's a great idea. The last thing I want to share with you today is really kind of what has prompted this broadcast today. Uh, this past week, I gave a lesson in one of my classes and what I usually do, uh, the, the program where I work are eight weeks, the sessions, the class periods are eight weeks. And usually at the four week mark, I actually conduct a, an assessment with students. Now, I know that all of the students at the end of my class will do a classroom evaluation, but I won't see any of their feedback until the end of the class when the class is complete and any comments that they have now, right in the moment, are not going to benefit me. They have concerns right now, but if I don't know about those concerns till after the class is over, their concerns being unclear and unknown to me will not help me change right now. So in my class, I did my regular assessment. I asked the students how they were feeling about the class. And then there were some concerns that came out of the class, out of that evaluation regarding the way in which I was teaching and so forth. I think they were very valid questions. But one of the things I would encourage you, number one, not only for your students' benefit, number two, not just for your benefit, but just personally as a teacher, but many times, and I would be interested in hearing about you, in your school, do your supervisors evaluate you to determine whether they will continue extending a contract to you? If, in fact, your contract, your employment is based on your students' responses and feelings toward your class, then the next thing I would recommend would be really important. So what I do is I always do a midterm evaluation. I used to, years ago, I used to have students write down their feelings on a piece of paper. And, but then students would say to me, Randall, you can, you know, my handwriting. And well, that's true. So what I've done is I've actually used a different service. And this service is called Mentimeter. And uh, let me just show this on the screen. It's called Mentimeter. And this is actually for online presentations and it is used for creating quick polls. The power of this is that you give students a link. Again, it is a free service. Of course, like any service there, there's the premium service. But for me, I usually create two slides. For example, uh, this class is helping me improve my uh, my grammar skills, my writing skills. And what I would probably encourage you to do is any questions you do in any type of survey midway through your class, make sure that they reflect the actual questions that students will be asked at the end of your class, if that is the case. And the nice thing about Mentimeter is not only can I create this quick thing, this quick poll where it says strongly agree, agree, not sure, disagree, and strongly disagree. And the possibilities of the type of questions are pretty much endless. But also what I do is I show another slide where in this particular case, students using their phones, I can do this right in the class if I want to. Again, you give students a link. Uh, and uh, or a number. There's actually a number that goes with each poll and then they can answer in real time. And so in this particular case, the first question was, how do you feel about it? And the second question is, what do you like about the class? What do you not like? And what can I do better? 
Now, many teachers say to me, Randall, I already do that. And in the end, when the class is over, still students still have the same concerns. Well, that certainly can be the case where students still have similar concerns. But I think what I found in my classes is students at least felt, and they indicate, for example, in an evaluation after the class is completely over, at least he took the time to listen to my feelings, that, that was willing to listen to my concerns. And that is really coming up and hearing from my students recently about concerns they had about my class and the things they wanted me to do really was the thing that really prompted me to do this. Uh, and again, Virginia says a great tool. Uh, one other comment that has come up is Elef says, time management is the most frequently difficulty that may face a teacher, especially novice teachers. Absolutely. The expected time is usually different from the rest, the real one, because of unexpected exterior conditions that may hinder the teaching process. Thank you, Ela, for sharing that. I think that improvisation is our key tool to adjust and plan on the spot. And this can only be acquired through experience and self-reflection. And Elif, I think that's probably one of the best places where we can kind of end this broadcast is the idea of adaptation. There have been many times when I've shared the idea of being like a chameleon, being chameleonic, the ability to change and adapt based on our situations. Today, again, I appreciate your comments today, but we've talked about the ideas of how to turn what you might view as a failure into a, a, a success, one of self-reflection, of growth, uh, of growth, of new vision into the future. And I would encourage all of you, as you're thinking about your classes and what you're doing, and Layla says, the weapon of an experimented teacher, right? Again, adaptation of being open to reflection and doing new things, I think is really important. And Rosina, thank you for very much for joining. Again, I want everyone... Um, thank everyone for joining the broadcast today about sharing your ideas on how to turn failures into successes. Sometimes I do this a little bit too much where I beat myself up realizing that a lesson didn't go well. But if I simply say, you know what, if I'm not experiencing failures, maybe I'm not experimenting enough, expanding my learning and knowledge. And I hope that all of you would learn to experiment, seeing your, you know, your failures, your shortcomings, your, your, your uh, differences in learning as new success. And Christine says uh, a failure in one group can be a success in a completely different group. I found that many cases where I'm teaching two, uh, two sections of the same class, and in one class it seems to fail, and in the other class it is a success. But by making just adjustments, I think that we can all experience greater growth and learning. Again, th everyone, thank you very much for joining the broadcast. If you're a teacher and you would like to join me on a broadcast, feel free to contact me privately. Again, I want to thank you for joining today's broadcast. Have a wonderful day and an even better tomorrow. Take care, everyone.